This is Joe Ingram One. Welcome to the third episode of my High Stakes PLO podcast. I'm hoping to come up with a different name for this that makes it a bit more unique at some point in time, but for now, it is known as the High Stakes PLO podcast. Each week, I'll be going over PLO hands posted on the 2 plus 2 poker forums in the High Stakes thread. And I will also sometimes take hands posted in different parts of 2 plus 2, and sometimes hands that are sent to me by other regulars that play the stakes on a regular basis. If you'd like to stay up to date on when I post these podcasts, you can follow me at on Twitter at JoeIngram1, or you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've been receiving more feedback on a daily basis about the podcast I've done so far, and the majority of the feedback has still been pretty good. There's been some feedback on things I could improve on, one being last week the audio levels were pretty low, which I actually turned down on purpose, so hopefully this week everyone will be able to hear properly. And another was that uh, people suggested that I show the hands on a hand replayer to make it more visible to them on a smaller screen. And I could not find a way to actually import the hands posted into a replayer. So I'm going to try zooming in this week a bit more and seeing if that helps. And if that does help, please let me know. And in the future, I'm going to try to figure out a way that I can take a hand that's posted and put it into a replayer so that it shows up that way. Because I agree that for some people, that's probably going to be a bit easier to follow what's going on. And it kind of makes the screen move, which... As some people pointed out, they don't like to, it's sometimes boring just to look at a blank screen, which is kind of why I put my face in the corner. That way it sometimes gives you something to look at if you're actually watching it instead of just listening to it. After last week's podcast, I ended up doing a bit of an interview on the Dutch Poker News website because I said some things about the Cleaner 11, who is a big time Dutch player. And they asked me a couple of different questions about different Dutch players, why I might not like the cleaner, different things like that. So if you're interested, you can click on the link in the description here and check that out. And I also finally made it in poker. I officially have my first news views gossip thread in NVG with my name in it. And it's also not followed by the, the, the phrase busto or scam someone out of a lot of money, which I'm happy about. It's actually about my podcast, and there have been some people posting some feedback in there, good and bad. And, uh, you know, I'm happy I'm happy the thread exists, and hopefully it'll be by up to 1 million views by the time all my podcasts are complete here. As far as the high stakes action this week goes, it appears that 2550 zoom, for the most part, does not really run that much. It looks like 1020 zoom is the main limit running as well, and it looks like during the peak times there's they're getting enough action at the regular and non-regular tables, but I'm a bit worried as far as what's going to happen to 2550 and 5100 because they essentially aren't don't seem like they're really running much anymore. And what I think is going to happen and kind of might have already happened is that all these people started playing 5k zoom and the people that lost probably lost a bit more a bit faster which i think was one of the arguments previously i might have read where zoom is a bad idea is that the bad players are actually going to lose faster because they are playing more hands but they're losing faster at that rate and it looks like there's probably a few guys that tried it out, lost a bunch of money, and might play it very sporadically in the future, which means that if there's not right six regulars ever starting any games, which it doesn't look like there's ever just six regulars playing, then there won't be any action. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But for now, we're going to get right into the hands for this week episode. And the screen, what you've been looking at, is um, just something I wanted to just quickly go over, which is what I do really well. It's you add it, you add uh, an image that's animated. It's called the GIF. You, you GIF a hand, essentially. It's where you take these animated pictures 
you insert them into poker hands where their their objective is to kind of tell a story in a way in the hand. So this is actually a hand I posted where it's an older hand between me and Alex KP. Now, I'm just going to explain real quick what I'm thinking when I GIF a, GIF a hand because people say I'm really good at it. So this specific hand right here, we'll start with this one. So I, I highlighted me and Alex KP. I used this, uh, this GIF of Sting pointing at Hulk Hogan, and this is basically me telling Alex KP, I'm coming for you. I'm taking your money. So we get into the flop, and or we get into my hand, and it's 8379, which, if you guys know, that's not a very good hand. So I then post this GIF of some people doing drugs, which means to play this hand, you probably are on drugs. And then I <laughs> post this other one where it's like people... Another drug-related one. I basically looked up drug drug images, and then I re-raised, which to re-raise with this hand, you probably are on drugs. And then I accentuated that by this baby throwing money out the window. So then Stickman ends up going up re-raising, and then when it gets back to me, I decide to just kind of essentially go all in before the flop. And I represent that probably bad decision by me by this young person hopping into mud. And then they both call. Then I post this GIF. Shit just got real because it got real. We're now going to play a big pot. And then I post, I showed their hands. And by now, everyone watching this forgot my hand and forgot their hand. But I have 3789. So on this flop, it's 1022. I use this image where it says fuck. Then I go all in for my last $800, which Alex has, and he calls, where he has Queen Jack 8 9, so he actually has the best hand right now. On the turn, I make a pair. So I to win the main pot, I need to get another three. The main pot's $12,000. I post this Katy Perry, like she's kind of like, like, please, like, please come. I need you so bad. I need you. I need a three. And then she's kind of crying. I don't I'm not sure what that might mean to the hand. And then the three comes and we're shocked. Holy shit, we won the hand. We're dancing, we're excited, and then we point to the money. And that's just a real quick, real quick uh, sample hand of what I might be thinking during a GIF hand. And I'll actually probably be opening up a GIF training site soon called GIF at Once, where I will make uh, training videos that are basically teach people how to GIF, in hand, GIF a hand um, appropriately. So yeah, look out for that. So let's get into the action this week. The first hand we have here is a uh, is between the legendary Odd Odson and the equally as legendary WCG Rider. WCG Rider is actually going to be the first guest on my podcast series I'm going to be calling The Poker Life. It's where I basically have conversations with different poker players that I know, and that's going to be coming out next week. And I think that, that that podcast series is going to be a great way for me to help give some exposure to people that don't really get to do a lot of interviews with different websites and, or different people. So I have some pretty interesting guests that are interesting to me, and I think that other people will find them interesting as well. But Doug will be the first guest on that, and I promise there will be some interesting conversation going on there. But let's get into the hand. So as you know, WCG Rider is a heads-up, no-limit player specialist, debatably one of the best in the world. But he's also been trying his hand at high-stakes PLO, and in this hand, he's against the legendary Odd Odson. So I don't, I can't, I can't claim to be a heads-up PLO pro, but I can, I know enough to discuss the hand. So in this hand, WCG opens the button. They're playing 100-200. WCG has king 7 10 3 with one suit, which is a perfectly fine hand to open heads up, and, uh, and Odd Odson calls with queen 8 8 4. And if you know anything about odds, he hates folding. He He's from Norway, and the Norwegians, they hate folding. So Odd Odson is not going to be folding many hands in this situation. So right away, the hand gets kind of interesting. WCG flops bottom pair, and he flops a blocker to the straight, and he makes a continuation bet, and odds check calls with a blocker to the straight and a backdoor flush draw, and it, 
he has so when he check calls here, he's it's I, I you know I'm not I I I'm not really sure. I don't know what his plan is actually because I think that he is going to ex check raise some turns. He also can make the second nut straight on a seven. And I think what happens here often enough is that WCG checks back the turn and then Otzen can either bluff the river or bet for value. And in the specific hand here, the queen comes on the turn and Otzen makes a pair of queens. And WCG bets pot, which I don't think that's a very good play because I don't think you always want to be potting here. I don't, I just, um, um, you know, WCG plays a lot of heads up and he he's probably has a reason for his sizing and why he's doing it with the hand he's doing it with. But it's certainly not a play that I would tend to make if I was playing heads up. And as far as from odds in position, he checked calls, which I guess, you know, I guess it's okay, but he's going to end up getting into a lot of river spots where he is kind of just flipping a coin when WCG bets. And on the river, the river is a two, so two, three, four, five, six. So basically any four now makes, any four X with X being two, three, five, or six has a straight now. And WCG chooses to bet half pot, which I actually like. And I think when he bets the turn, he probably needs to bet this river. And well, because Odson has the blocker to the four, he assumes that the only value hands that WCG probably has here is a straight and he has a four. So it's really hard to make a straight if you have one of the cards in your hand to make a straight. So he decides to call and as we see, Odson is never wrong and he wins a $16,000 pot. That's the first hand of the week. The second hand is going to be on a replayer. So we'll see how you guys like it. It is between, oh, a hand my friend uh, Leo sent me. Isl he plays online as Isildrun. He's a coach poker coach over on Run It Once. He makes great videos. He's made videos that have helped me so much. Thank you, Leo, for making these videos. Thank you for making everybody better. Everyone loves you for it. Thank you. Keep on the keep up the good work. So we get into this hand, and this hand actually is pretty cool. So I gotta do the replay here. So let's see what happens here. So Leo has King King Queen 8 with one suit and Jedi Master 82. Jedi Master 82 we can talk a bit about him. He's been around for a very long time. I believe he's Swedish. And he he plays he, he, I think he's really I think he's really really good. He post uh, he used to post sometimes on the forums. He'd post these really weird hands with broken English where he talks about raping people in the ass or something like that. And um I, I don't know. I guess he like you know he likes to rate people in the ass, and that seems fine to me. You know he's a good poker player, but but yeah, not really too much else is known about him. So in this hand, this hand actually gets interesting. So this holds around three bets. They're about 300 big blinds deep, and he flops a king high flush draw and I guess middle pair and the over pair. So he he c bets and Jedi Master calls. This is going to be interesting. We're actually going to talk about it from both hands' perspective until we get to the river. So on the turn, he turns trips, and he decides to bet again. He chooses a pretty good size, and things are interesting. Jedi Master raises a pretty tiny-ish size. Now, when he raises here, he's essentially representing an 8. And he's trying to get Isildurun either to fold a hand with equity right now, some type of any, any flush draw, sometimes... Uh, Isildurun might fold an overpair without a flush draw. Like, there's going to be hands he's folding here. So the raise, I, I like. I think it's a good raise, no matter with what hand he has. It just puts your opponent in a very tough spot, and when you're playing, you want to be putting other people in tough spots. So Isildurun calls, and the river is the jack, which, which from Leo's perspective, he does block queen 10, and he should suspect that Jedi Master most likely wouldn't raise a 7-10 hand or a queen-10 hand on the turn 
So it's not that bad of a card from, from having a straight perspective. And there's also some hands that he actually beats that might bet for value. Because Jedi Master, I remember he, he likes to, he sometimes value bets sort of light in a way. And I think if you value bet a hand like eight, seven, five, six here, so you have three eights with a bad kicker, sometimes I think you can you could possibly expect to get called by worse, like some sort of ace, ace, ten hand, like an overpair with a flush draw that missed with a blocker to the straight, but it's just, that's pretty li pretty light, so I'm not sure if he actually has any, I'm sure he, he probably has some value bets here in his range, but he pops and Isildurun calls and Jedi shows up with Jack 3, 2, 7. So on the flop, he had a gut shot and bottom pair. On the turn, he turned obviously turned his hand into a bluff. And on the river, he decided to follow through. Now, now as far as his sizing goes on the river, I don't think I like it because I, I don't know if Leo folds an 8 if he has an 8, which he has an 8, and he essentially has one of the worst 8s he can have that is in a full house. So if he's not folding an 8 here, I don't know. I think he can, I think you can get him to fold if he bets a bit less. I think he can, if he, he's trying to get him essentially to fold a hand like aces or kings with a flush draw on the turn. I feel like when he bets this river, I don't think he expects him to fold an 8. So, but he might expect him to fold an eight. But I think that hand was pretty interesting. Thank you, Leo, for sending me that hand. And that was our with our replayer. I kind of like the replayer. It's pretty cool. So we get into this next hand here. It is between two of my favorite poker players online right now, the legendary Skervoy, Andreas. To I can't pronounce his last name. But I talked about him a bit last week. He runs the site over at nutblocker.com, which is a uh, PLO community. And uh, he's, you know, he's a super nice guy. And he's been, been around playing the high-stakes PLO games for years. He used to play the super high-stakes games on Full Tilt back in the day. I believe he's one of the biggest winners on high-stakes database ever, which is obviously it's incredibly impressive. And he's still doing it right now. So, and then in this hand, we also have Caramont, who we've talked about in the two previous podcasts. He's an American, relocated. Um, last week, we saw him playing a bit psychotic, and there was some suspicion from myself that he might have been on drugs during those hands. So, we didn't get to confirm or deny that, but it looks like this week he's, he's playing better. So, this hand, he opens the button with 5, 6, 9, 10, and Skittleboy, 3 bets, 7, 7, 8, 8, which which is good. It's a perfect hand to three bet with. Caramont calls and the flop. Caramont flops a full house. Basically the nuts. Skedavoy continuation bets here. And I think that you should be continuation betting some hands here. And you should be checking some hands here. This is a flop where things get a bit dicey. Your opponent can re raise you here and put you in a very tough spot with a lot of different hands. And on the turn, Skedavoy decides to bet again when the flush gets there. And I think I think you you have to you you have to be betting the flop and turn here with air sometimes. You can't because you're not really going to have enough value hands here to always. I'm um, that wasn't going to make sense what I was going to say. Let's just take that comment back. <laughs> sometimes I just say weird things. But, okay, he goes ahead and bets the turret, and Caramont smooth calls again with the full house, which I think is a really good play. Because I think it, if he raises here, Skidhoi folds, obviously, all his bluffs. He, If he has a flush that he's deciding to bet on the turn for value, he sometimes might fold a flush. He might fold a nine sometimes. He might just fold aces with a net flush blocker sometimes. So... On the river, Skedavoy decides to essentially represent Aces full here, and he jams the river. And Caramont probably was kind of sad, but he called anyway. And his river jam here, I think, is, I think it's fine. I think it's a play sometimes that you need to be doing with with your hands, where you need to, you know, you want to be bluffing sometimes here. And I think this is a pretty good spot to bluff. He probably expects Caramont to fold a flush if he has a flush. So 
yeah, I think that that's perfectly fine. And um, yeah. So this hand was actually a hand Alex KP posted in the high stakes PLO BBB thread. And that's a thread where people post, um, it's like a, they post like hands where they either made like a really sick play or they got, they got really unlucky or they got really lucky. And on this hand, I actually think this hand's edited. I think he made up his cards because Alex is a big nit. And as you'll see, he probably would not bluff 331 big blinds versus anybody. But we're going to act like the hand's real for for podcast sake. So it's with the legendary Hollandall, who's been around forever. I feel like I've said the word legendary a few times in this podcast, but a lot of these people are pretty, they're legendary players. They've been around forever. They've, they've made a lot of money. They're, they're essentially the guys that people look up to as, you know, I'd like I'd want to be that person one day. I'd like to have that success one day. So, you know, I think they're pretty legendary. But in this hand, I don't, this hand can't be real. I don't think it's real. I think Alex probably folds his preflop, to be honest. He's a big net, even blind versus blind. So Hollandall opens the small blind, and Alex KP calls with 8, 3, 5, 10. And on the flop, he flops a 10 high flush draw, and Hollandall check calls. On the turn, Hollandall checks again, and Alex KP pots it with, he turns a open and a straight draw, and he still has a flush draw. And then Hollandall check, I'm not sure if he checked, I'm not sure if that's pot, but he checked raises, and Alex makes a pretty bad call where, in that, even if a club comes on the turn, there's really, like, there's no good, like, a four or a nine that's not a club are your best turn cards, and I think a lot of the times, you're just going to get, you're going to have to fold. But this is where I think the hand gets edited, is that Hollandall bets the three. And I really think that Alex KP probably had four, five, eight, ten in his hand here. Because as we see by the use of GIFs, he posts this GIF, meaning that now he thinks of a plan in his head. He's like, wait, I have an idea. He decides to raise and he posts the classic, uh, that, that MMA fighter woman. That's a pretty generic. These are two really generic GIFs. Don't ever use these GIFs in a hand. Just dig a bit deeper when you search. You don't want to use the GIFs at the top of the search. You don't want to use the same GIFs everybody uses. You know, be creative. Get some un uniqueness out of your shit. So he raises. He did not. He had 4-5 for sure. And um, Hollandall tanks, tanks, and then he posts this to be like, he's excited. And then he folds and he gets excited. So yeah, this hand I just wanted to show again for GIF purposes. And I think Alex, okay, guys, don't post hands where you fucking change the whole cards, okay? Just please don't do that. He changed the whole cards here. There's a 85 to 95% chance because, yeah. Although if he was bluffing, I mean, it's a suicide of bluff. Just throwing in 300 big blinds on the river. Hollandall doesn't like to fold either. But Alex is a big nit. Hollandall knows that probably. Huh. Cool. I like the hand. This is the biggest hand of the week at 2550. It's between Suzuki234 and our friend Hillary Zygmunt. And Suzuki, I've like changed his color on his label maybe five times over the years. Because sometimes he plays like an idiot. Sometimes he plays an aggressive idiot. Sometimes he plays good, good, aggressive. Sometimes he just plays good. He's what does that mean, guys, when when a, when an account shows up and plays four or five different styles? I don't know, let's ask the Village Bike Barcode, but it usually means that there's different people playing on the account. So Hillary, obviously Hillary, very questionable player, Hillary. In this hand, Hillary makes a surprise, a questionable play. So he three bets and Sazuki four bets. Hillary calls, the flop is three, seven, eight. With a flush draw, it gets checked through. The turn, Hillary bets half pot and Sazuki calls. And on the river, Hillary check, raises all in, and Suzuki calls. You can't see a bit. It's off screen because I'm zoomed in. And the hands that they show up with, Suzuki has the nuts. And Hillary turns a trip queens on the river into a bluff. So let's talk about his river play. I think everything from the flop play. I think the flop check back by Suzuki when he four bets is fine. They're 300 big blinds deep. He flops top pair with an open-ended straight draw and a bad flush draw, so he probably doesn't want to get check raised. So I think his hand's fine to check back there. 
the turn, he turns top two pair and a flush draw, and Ellery bets with top pair and a blocker. Now, I guess I, this probably isn't a spot I would bet, but I'm sure you should be, like, every spot you should be betting sometimes. So his bet seems okay, I guess. But the river is where I might disagree with some plays here. So Suzuki makes the nuts and he bets and Hillary check jams. Now he's definitely bluffing here and I I don't know I don't know what he's doing because if Suzuki is value betting an A side flush, which it's really hard for him to have an A side flush here, he might fold that. If Suzuki is betting a king high flush for value, he might fold that. But I think for in Suzuki's spot, a king high flush and an ace high flush are basically the same thing. But at the same time, he has to be thinking with those hands, what the fuck would he what what the fuck is he doing? Why would he if he so if Suzuki has a flush on the river, he sometimes is just gonna check it back. But also, he definitely would value bet because Hillary's hand doesn't. So Hillary's hand doesn't look like a full house when he bets the turn, because the flush got there on the turn. So his hand sort of his hand basically looks like a flush. So Suzuki probably would value bet a king high flush there. I'm not sure if he bet a jack high flush because if he probably wouldn't bet a jack high flush. And sometimes Hillary wouldn't bet a king high flush because the board did pair. So Hillary doesn't want to bet and get raised by Suzuki. So he would sometimes check those hands and try to get the showdown. But obviously these players have different dynamics. Some value bet lighter than others in spots where other people wouldn't value better. Other people might not call with worse in some spots. So as far as can he call, I don't I guess he might probably can't call because he doesn't beat anything, most likely, that Suzuki would be bluffing, assuming Suzuki doesn't bluff here often, which I think he bluffs here sometimes. But, yeah, I don't, I just think, I, don't, I just think the check jam's bad. I mean, check folding sucks, check calling's not fun, but yeah, I think that's a little bit spewy. So, let's get into the next hand here. This is between the Gunman and Caramont at 2550. So the Gunman, what do I remember about him? I had him labeled as a as a regular kind of fishy, kind of okay. But I think he's more on the fishy side though of players. So the Gunman opens the button here with five, seven, nine, ten, and oh, this hand's interesting. Sounds really interesting. Caramont, three bets, ace, king, queen, ten, double suited, such a gorgeous hand. And the gunman calls with five, seven, nine, ten, double suited. So on the flop, they're 150 big points deep. On the flop, Caramont flops top pair, top kicker on two, two, ten. And he bets, and the gunman decides to raise with his hand. And Caramont calls. So they are really deep. So the gunman's going to put him in some interesting spots in later streets by raising here. And he's, he's, he's sort of saying, I have a two by this raise. So on the turn, Caramont turns top two pair, and the gunman bets again. And once again, Caramont check calls. Now he picks up a gutter. He picks up some outs to improve his hand to beat a two. But on the river, so they obviously... They have a dynamic. They Caramon's seen something from the gunman's play to know that this guy's crazy and he can bluff here. So on the river's the nine, and the gunman decides to bet here. Now, from Caramon's standpoint, I think this makes the call easier on the nine because he blocks a straight, he blocks a full house, and he there's gonna be a lot of the if if the gunman has a two, he might check it back here if he has like a two ace. Like a, like a, some type of two, but then again, he might turn that into a bluff. You know, I got. I'm just trying to think of different possibilities here. What what these people are actually thinking, I'm not sure. But I think Caramont's call, I think his call's fine. And, I, and like I said, with the gunman, he does some fishy shit. So I don't think the call's bad against him. And sometimes he lose, but 
when you have the blockers, sometimes you win. So let's get into the next hand here. This is between, uh, let's see here. This is Barry Sweet poning it up. Barry Sweet, man, he plays this a lot. He seems like he's doing well too. This hand's with him and JPAA. Now JPAA, he's been a while. He plays a, a very aggressive, aggressive bad though. Like I think he's a tournament player too. But he's certainly not a winning PLO player. And if he is a winning PLO player, I'd be very surprised. But I don't think he's a winning PLO player. So in this hand, very sweet, three bets, the under the gun open with ace, ace, four, five. And JP cold four bets from the small blind with queen, jack, ten, seven, which is an acceptable play. Some people might flat, some people might fold, some people might four bet, four betting there. If you like variance, you four bet. So very sweet decides to call with aces slow play which which i don't jp is not a guy to three bet fold like i don't think J, jp ever three bets a hand here and then folds it to barry sweets all in so i don't actually think barry sweet needs to call here some players will cold four bet here and then fold to a five bet so that's why flatting would be a play you could make and i don't think jp is one of those guys i don't think you need to do this but he does it and jp that's 775 into 3300 on the flop, which seems okay with nothing on 665. On the turn, he turns at 10 and he decides to go all in. And I guess, hmm. I mean, this is the kind of spot you get yourself in when you cold four bet this hand is that you end up on the turn where you improve your hand, but you, when you bet and get called, oftentimes you're not winning the hand and you're drawing pretty slim. And that's actually what happened. So he bet and Barry Sweet's play obviously is perfectly standard on the flop. There's not much reason to raise on the turn. He calls and he wins the hand. Yeah, I think that's an interesting kind of four bet hand. It just shows you some people aren't always four betting aces here in a spot like this. So the next hand is between this is this hands was just like cool because I was just I was at first when I browsed this hand I was like meets is a fucking idiot. I was trying not to swear that much this, this as much this podcast. So I thought meets was an idiot. But as we've seen in the results meets is not an idiot. He's winning. He's doing really well. So mama said opens the button with 30 big blinds meets calls in the small blind. I don't know if I like his call pre flop to the min race, especially with a very aggressive big blind who is going to be three betting here fairly often to try to get Mama said knock you out all in for 30 big blinds. So Ben three bets with aces. Mama said knock you out four bets, essentially all in with ace, queen, nine, nine, which I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what you should do with 30 big blind stacks with hands like this in this spot. You don't want to call. You don't want to fold. It's so pretty. So it's, I'm not. I can't. I can't speak too much on on thirty big blind play, but meets. So meets. I guess he's putting Ben on a high, high, high ace, ace, ace type hand, ace king, king, king. He's putting Mama said on a high ace, ace high rundown type hand. So he thinks this two six four seven is probably in pretty good shape here. And it turns out, look at this. He's forty one percent pre flop. That's crazy. This is why PLO is an amazing game. If you're not playing PLO, you need to start playing PLO. You know, I've actually gotten a, a really large amount of messages on 2 plus 2 on Facebook still from people just saying, hey, I started playing PLO. Like, thank you for these podcasts. You, Me listening to you talk about PLO has just made me want to play more PLO. And I, I love that because that's my goal is, out of all this is that you want to play PLO because it's so fun. Like, it's, it's not... Just because I don't want you to play no limit, it's that no limit's kind of boring. PLO is great. You can get all in here with two, six, four, seven, and be a favorite. That's just, that's awesome. That's what makes this game great, and that's what makes it. Fun. It's just fun. So, and he ends up winning the hand, which is cool. That's super cool. So, get next hand here. Oh yeah, this was a, a comment on a hand. This guy, what's up, King of Loss? He he posted something about a hand where uh, me played. Ami um, is, so I've played a lot with Ami. Um, I met Ami um, before at a Poker Stars dinner in Vancouver when I was living there. And Ami, um, me and him used to play all the time. 
we played a lot, just heads up, shorthanded. I mean, we I, he probably didn't have much respect for my game. I probably didn't have much respect for his game. I thought he was a bit crazy. He probably thought I was a bit crazy. And truth be told, we were both crazy. So, and now he's also he's also a tournament player. His tournament results lately have been tremendous. And his PLO results, he went on the sickest PLO heater ever. And from the looks of some hands I, I saw posted where he played Jungle Man, I think he was running pretty well. But with that said, he is winning lately. So, you know, cool, right? Good for him. I hope he really, I hope he starts playing more. I hope he doesn't knit it up and take all his winnings off the bank. Or if, he, if he's in makeup, then he... I don't think he's, he might be in makeup. You know these tournament guys. They're in like a million dollar makeup. You win a tournament for 400000 you're 600000 in makeup. So I don't really know how, <laughs> how it works. But uh, yeah, so this hand, um, two rated I asked the question, how can uh, me flat here instead of getting in? And actually kind of uh, similar to the hand posted before with Barry Sweet, where sometimes you just want to be, you want to play against people that, that you can flat aces in the spot. So he might think that Lima, now I don't know who Lima is, I think Lima's a kind of a weaker player, but he might think Lima's sometimes might put in $2,700 pre-pop and fold. That's the only real real reason you could give for actually flatting here. But decides to play just to stack off on a bad flop. I mean stack off here, but why not pre-flop? Well, I don't think this is a bad flop for his hand. 9-8-2, I think that's pretty good flop for aces, especially versus a four bet. So I don't think that's a bad flop, but yeah, I think pre-flop, I, I think it's not the worst thing ever to flat aces here. So I don't necessarily really think it matters too much to be honest with you. So let's get into a couple more hands here. I'm gonna try not to make this episode as long as the previous episodes. Just because people look at the timer, they're like an hour and 20 minutes. Holy shit, I don't want to watch this guy talk for an hour and 20 minutes. I'm just not going to watch. But really, you can stop watching any time. You don't need to watch an hour and 20 minutes. You can watch 30 minutes and never watch it again. But this hand is between... This hand, oh, this hand was weird. So this is with very sweet Sera Ilaziz, who um, definitely down swinging since Zoom's been introduced. He was a bum hunter before, like I had mentioned, and it shows shows he was a bum hunter. And this is with Dr. Pompe, who is who who was I thought I thought I played with him a lot. I played with everybody a lot. I'm gonna say that all the time. I played with him a lot, and I I had him labeled as a topper tier fish, but he's not. I don't think he is. I think he like kind of has an idea what he's doing. I'm assuming he's a doctor. His last name's Pompe. He probably is a neurosurgeon in Brazil. And but he played like surprisingly well, and normally at most of the tables he always had a pretty deepish stack. So in some of the hands I've seen here, he's had a pretty deepish stack, and he hasn't really made any bad plays. So I'm gonna have to take away top tier status from him and maybe put him in the middle tier status. But in this hand, very sweet opens the button, and Sarah flats aces. Doctor, he probably expects Doctor Pumpe. Plus he has bad aces. He doesn't need to always three bet these aces. And Dr. Pompe, three bets, very sweet, cold calls with five, seven, eight, ten, double suited. And Sierra tries to get tricky by small four betting. That way, Dr. Pompe can go all in, therefore opening up the action for Sierra to get an all in preflop. Unfortunately, Sierra's plan fails. Dr. Pompe calls, very sweet calls. But does it fail? Because he somehow gets. He pots this flop, and he gets Barry to call. Now, I was thinking about this hand while I looked at it, and I was like, at first, you look at the flop call, and you're like, well, that's a terrible call. He's got 5, 7, 8, 10, if you can't see his hand here. 5, 7, 8, 10. So he has a gutter, two backdoor flush draws. Now, he's got the backdoor three, backdoor trip draw. Yeah, yeah. So on the flop, he is 36%, and he probably... He, he's a smart guy where he can probably get to the point where he knows his equity in this situation. So on the flop, when he thinks about, he has to put in, he expects to end up getting all his money in most of the time on the turn. So I would think that he suspects he has enough equity to get all in here essentially on the flop with the two back doors in the gutter versus Sarah's aces, which Sarah clearly has aces. So, 
So Kenny Call, it's super high variance. I probably wouldn't call here, but but he does call, and I think the call is an interesting spot because it's just not a spot I would I would see this flop myself sometimes, and I'd be like, well, I gotta fold. But when you take into account Dr. Pompey's extra fourteen hundred pre-flop then it might make it closer to a call. So, I mean, I guess I could actually do math on this real quick, but who likes math? No one wants to do math. So we'll get into a couple more hands here. Let's see this one. This is with JP. So once again, JP, we have him cold for betting, a uh, weird hand. So he has three, seven, nine, ten. Meets opens the button. Uh, the tally star, uh, three bets, the small blind. JP decides to YOLO it up in 4 bet 3, 7, 9, 10, double suited, meets calls, tally calls. And on the flop, essentially they get all in on the flop. When I mean, meets just check calls. I mean, I'm not like I don't know why they just don't go all in on the turn flop, but it doesn't matter too much. So JP flops a he flops this is sick. He flops one of the best hands possible, a 10 high flush draw with 10 high. And a backdoor straight draw. And meets flops the they're literally 50-50 on the flop. That's cool. He flops a flush draw with a backdoor straight draw and a pair. And on the turn, he turns two pair. J turns a gutter, but either way, it's irrelevant because they're getting only no matter what. And J ends up losing, which is why you probably shouldn't three bet, four bet, three, seven, nine, ten, cold four bet this hand. Unless you like action. Okay, so I'm going to be doing about two more hands here. I just looked ahead for a couple more hands I want to do and then we can get this wrapped up here. So this one is, it's a sh it starts off at 5,100 where Dr. Pompe is only 50 big blinds effective, but I still think it's kind of an interesting decision here. So Pompe opens a small blind with ace ace, queen 10, one suit, odd odds and calls with king jack 8 6, and the flop is king queen 5. So Pompe flops an over pair with a gut shot and Odson flops top pair with a backdoor club draw. So when he when Pompe C bets here, it's standard. When Odson calls, you can't really do much else than call. It kind of sucks on a lot of turns where Pompe shows aggression. But so this is weird. So obviously, like Pompe is some sort of tear fish because he turns a nut flush draw and he decides to check call on a six, which it's really bad because you should probably just keep betting. You get value from some more hands, or if you're going to check, you should probably check raise because you probably get it in pretty good sometimes. But he decides to check call, and then on the river, the 10 gets, so the straight completes. So he decides to turn his blockers. I guess he decides to use his blockers and bluff here. I mean, he has two pair. He has some showdown. And then Otzen. Otzen just call, he just calls all the time. Never loses, huh? Well, that's why he's up like $55 million the past year, two years. Odd Otzen. You know, me and Odd Otzen, we used to, man, I think I've actually played maybe more hands with Otzen in my lifetime than I have with most other players. So we played it. He took a shot before. He was always in mid stakes, played a lot of tables. He took a shot at high stakes. He took a couple shots at high stakes and never just worked out for him. He always ended up coming back to 2 4. And this is when I was patrolling the 2 4 streets eight hours a day, just playing 24 tables, playing anybody heads up. And I just was playing. I was didn't know what was going on. All those Supernova Elite times. And me and him would battle all the time because he played all the games too. So we just played so many hands together. And then eventually, I think we kind of started both playing, moving up 5, 10, 10, 20 around the same time. Remember there was one point in time we were playing four tables of 10, 20 heads up. And I don't think the results were anything one way or the other. But I was like, yeah, I don't want to play you ever again. <laughs> and then shortly after that, you started just annihilating everybody, man. It's so sick. Odd Odson, man. One of my heroes. But yeah, he just started crushing. And he's, he's he showed me his graph one time. And it was awesome. It was so awesome. You know, I'm very proud of him, man. Because, you know, there's the... I said, you know, it might have been the first time. I'm trying not to say you know um, or like. I'm trying to work on my podcast delivery this time around. But Odson, he's a guy in a way similar to myself before. We both loved mass tabling. 
And I think his win rate was always better than mine when we were mass tabling. So, but he's a mass tabler who just worked his way up, kept taking shots, fell back down. But he's the kind of guy who he could take those shots just like I could take those shots. You can take shots if you're comfortable and knowing that you can drop back down and grind it all back up. That's that's what you do if you can if you can handle it. But some people that that they, it gets to them, they can't handle that that mental feeling of of knowing like God, I just lost a hundred thousand dollars. I'm gonna have to play for three weeks to make it back. I'm gonna have to play for four weeks to make it back and then they end up playing their C game. They end up losing more money. And then before you know it, they're in a really big hole and they're not, and sometimes they're not even at the regular stakes. They drop back down to play. So I think there's a certain type of person that can really handle shot taking repeatedly, but keeping themselves in a comfortable position to continue being comfortable and taking those shots in the future. And as you see, if you keep working on your game, eventually when you run good, you play well, the shots will be successful. And I think everyone's had a few successful shots in their life. But eventually you might grow out of that shot-taking phase. And sometimes you never grow out of the shot-taking phase. But obviously, this is Odson is the extreme example of shot-taking gone right, finally. Because he took a shot and he's made millions of dollars on both sites since and he challenged a congressman in Norway, he beat him, he crushed him. So he's a great person to look up to for the aspiring PLO players who who, you know, they think it's it's only these magic players can be at the high stakes like like it's not the story is not really told that you can still work your way up. It's not it's not out of the realm of possibility. You can still start at 25 cent, 50 cent, work your way up to 50 cent dollar, work your way up to one, two, work your way up to two, four. You, that's still possible. And if you want a case, you can look at someone like myself, or you can look, look at someone like Otson, who's, you know, been able to do that. And it takes work. You got to put it in the hours. You can't, you know, I hear a lot of people, they, they send me messages like, what do I got to do? You know, what, why? why am I not up there or anything? Like, why, why can't I play high stakes? Why can't I be successful? And a lot of time it's work ethic. You got to put the hours in. People aren't putting the hours in. You know, I was playing eight to 10 hours a day for years. A guy like Odson's playing hours a day, hours a day. This guy's a fucking machine, hours a day. The people that achieve that ultimate success are people that are going to put in the work. None of the... You know, there's some fucking around in there. There's some YouTube watching for an hour or two, two plus two browsing, Reddit browsing. But for the most part, it's the people thinking about poker, looking over hands, doing poker math, talking poker with friends, and just playing the hands, trial and error, over and over and over again. And those are the people that are ultimately going to achieve that success. And there's always going to be the people who dwell on their bad luck sort of say like they're like why me why do i run so bad why aren't i winning and the truth be told is that you're just not good enough a large majority of the time or you might be good enough but you're making some bad plays sometimes like all in ev only tells a bit of the story you can be up below ev and you can still be winning a bunch of money because there's so many other spots that you play throughout a poker session and the big hands they account for pretty big percentages of the ups and downs. But if you're good in all these other spots, you make up for that. Now, they don't talk about these things in anywhere else really, but that's that's the fact of the matter is that the all in EV doesn't tell the whole story. You could be winning a lot of money running above or running above EV, I guess, and you could be fucking terrible. But you know, like all in EV just doesn't you can't really judge it off that you have to judge it off the actual place and yeah that last part actually kind of didn't make too much sense i got kind of caught up in a moment i get really passionate about things when i talk sometimes and i just got passionate about that subject because it's just something you see often and if i had that mindset where where you know woe is me kind of thing i never would have been able to have success and i think when i finally shook that mindset was when i finally did have start to have a bit more success.
So, so yeah, I think uh, I think that's actually going to be the last hand here. Well, we're getting to one more hand here. One more hand. One more hand because you made it this far. And if you made it this far, thank you. That's awesome. Like I said, 15 to 20% make it this far. Most of the people check out after the first 30 minutes. And for the people that are this far, you know, you guys obviously enjoy the podcast, enjoy listening. If you have any suggestions, feel free to send me a message. Feel free to to say that you made it this far because when I even when I see posts in like the thread that was made, like, hey dude, I listened to your all your podcast. I'm in the 15%. Like that shit, that shit's cool. Like I like hearing that. I like knowing that there's someone out there that listened to this, enjoyed it, and wants to hear more. Like that's what you know makes me. I have to stop saying you know. I swear to God, I'm gonna stop saying that. But that's what makes me excited to do these stuff is just put this out there and and you know give something back. Within poker, you can't really give many things back. Your objective is to win money. Like my objective is to fucking take Caramon's money. <laughs> that's that's what your objective. You want to take Ben Ben's money. You want to take Mama said not cute out's money. You want to hunt them. You want to figure out a way to beat these people. And there's really not too many ways that you can actually give back without you know full blown here i'm going to teach you strategy i'm going to teach you how to win so this is like a happy medium i found and yeah i enjoy doing it and i hope you, some people out there enjoy hearing about it and even if 10 people enjoy hearing it that's more than enough for me to want to do it so get in this hand real quick and then we're going to wrap it up uh caramont in between caramont and verbo oasis verbo oasis runs like the runs like the brazilian sun i mean oh my he runs better almost than anybody. I've, I've had a chance to meet Verve. He's very nice. He's so nice. He's a really nice guy. I really like him. Gotta be honest. And uh, yeah, let's get in the hand. So uh, Verve opens 4, 5, 7, 8, double suited under the gun. Karamat calls it the small blind with King King 6, 2. Karamat, check raises, top set, chooses a very small size, which I think is okay because when you check raise this flop, you're not going to have too many hands for value. So you probably might want to use a small size sometimes. But you're going to get pwned sometimes when you're out of position here. So Verve calls with a gut shot, backdoor flush, backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw, or gut shot straight draw, rather. And I guess some backdoor straights. On the turn, Verve turns the flat, turns the straight. That's Verve Oasis, boys. That's how he does it. All you guys in Brazil that are watching this, voila, this is how Verve does it. And then on the river is where actually the most interesting spot occurs. Caramont turns a sand into a bluff. I don't know what's going on in the I don't know why he shoved. I'd like to know why you shoved. I don't know why you shoved. What are you trying? Are you trying to get him to fold the flush? He's not folding the flush, clearly. Are you trying to get him to fold? What are you trying to get him to fold? Are you value betting? What are you hoping he calls with? Did you misread your hand? Might have misread your hand. Those drugs down there in Mexico, man. They're good, but let, I mean, you know, you can do drugs two, night, two nights a week. I'm going to give you my advice, which I didn't follow. When you do drugs, take off that day, take off the next day. I, I, if I would have done that, I would have lost $800,000 less than I lost. And I swear to God. Actually, you probably lost more because there would be day, the sober days I'd end up winning the money back. So if I would have followed that advice, if I never would have played on days I did drugs or days after the day I did drugs, I would probably have 800 to 1 million, 800,000 to 1 million more dollars right now. So Caramont, my advice to you, hookers, drugs, strippers, blow, they're fun, but they're not that fun. That's going to be it, guys. Uh, like I said, follow me on Twitter at JoinGerman to get podcast updates. Subscribe to the channel. Post in the threads on 2 plus 2. And I hope you come back next week where we will talk some more Pot Limit Omaha. And also, for the people that are listening to this before next week, so if you're listening to this 10 months from now, go check out my interview with WCG writer Doug Polk, which will be posted on my YouTube page in a couple days. So thank you very much.